I had gotten a scholarship from Queen's College, Guyana, to do history in UCWI Mona. Right. When I got there, I discovered that the people in the English department were led by a professor, an English professor, A. K. Croston, uh, who felt that his black people couldn't handle the literature. Okay. And, uh, and for years, there hadn't been first class honors in, in, in English. I had done the A level in English twice and gotten the distinction twice. And I had a scholarship, which was an, op an open scholarship. So I changed from history into, into literature. And so Gavaya, when I went to deregister, asked me, well, why are you <laughs> getting out of the history even before you've gotten into it? To the history. And I told her that well, I, I felt I was more comfortable with the literature. Mm -hmm. And she expressed a lot of regret. She said that, but you had brought, you brought first in the scholarship examination uh, in history, which made me worry a, li a little bit because <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't see that anything that I had written there yeah. could be, you know, could make me bring first. So I, I worried about the other candidates. <laughs> um, when, I, when I went to, the, to, to register into the English Honors Program, Croston asked me, well, why am I coming into this program? And I said, well, I got distinction twice in literature and I have an open scholarship. And I don't think that anybody could keep me out of this program. And he watched at me and he told me, well, <laughs> well, we have an exam at the end of the first term, that's December, when we weed out people. <laughs> and, <laughs> you planning to weed you out already? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> They weed you out, <laughs> and um, if you if you don't pass that exam, I said all right. And I did I, I did the exam. I passed the exam, and I remained in the program because the other alternative would have been a BA general mm -hmm. in English and history and some something else. In fact, the BA general students were much better educated. Mm -hmm. um, but we were very snobbish about doing an honors degree in literature and this kind of thing. And, and so, but I didn't join the BA general group. I stayed in the English class and went through it. Now, the question you asked is why, how I came to do Conrad. Conrad, yeah. We thought a bit of him in the modern lit um, class. Mm -hmm. The modern lit class was a peculiar class because it started from the 19th century, Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. and it came right down through Dickens, George Eliot, um, the Brontes, and then the, it, it virtually ended with Conrad. Right. But they, they tucked in Naipaul and Walcott. Hmm. Um, as a tri tribute to, I mean, I tribute to something, <laughs> but they weren't teaching any full West Indian literature program. Right. Because the only writers they considered to have made the cut mm -hmm. would have been Walcott. Night <laughs> <laughs> <And I> Paul. Night <laughs> <I> Cut. Night <laughs> Cut. Walcott and Night Cut. <laughs> um, so I did, I did Conrad, I did, I read up a lot of, well, I read a lot of, like, I said a lot, what Night Paul there was to read. At the time. I, at the time I had read, House of Mr. Business had just come out, actually. Mm -hmm. 
I, I read that too. I entered into a competition, Alan Lane Prize, uh, and some, and it, it was based on my poem, and I submitted an essay which won the prize, though I didn't know this until after I had left the university. Conrad, I had read a bit of um, in school. I don't think he was being taught in school, but I'd, I'd read, I think, Lord Jim. Mm -hmm. I think I had read uh, Typhoon, mm -hmm. read Youth. Um, and then at the university, I, I, I read Negro the Narcissus, Heart of Darkness for sure, mm -hmm. and Nostromo, The Shadow Line. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to be a whole lot of uh, novels by a singer, in that days you had to call him British novelist. Mm -hmm. um, I'd read E.M. Forster, one or two things. Um, but when I went to scholarship, they asked me what, what I'm going to do. I had no idea. <laughs> um, I, I could go back to Guyana and apply for a job somewhere and maybe get a job teaching. Or uh, what I told um, Professor Croston, and that's Bridget Burton's father, okay. who was a very good teacher of 17th century poetry, and but he taught me 18th century, and was very good at that too. Um, taught him, I said, well, you know, I'd like to do a postgrad degree. And he said, well, what do you want to do it in? <laughs> it was not wrong when I said Joseph Conrad. Was <laughs> <laughs> so just a, just a, 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 the first idea that came to you? Yeah, it came to me because it was, you see, it was the only, apart from Conrad, I'd, I'd read a few novels by Graham Greene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought Conrad uh, was more interesting for mm -hmm. some reason. Mm -hmm. And um, so now he said, but you, you're applying very late, you know, this is the middle of the year. Um, and all of these places, all, all places that I could think of that might offer modern novel, a modern novel program, uh, would have completed their list. So he applied to Birmingham University he applied to Manchester University. There was a guy named, their name Berkonzi or something. And he applied somewhere else. But Birmingham University came through first and says, send him, send him, send him. <laughs> and, and, uh, so that is, that is how I came to hurriedly leave Mona because I was landing around Mona. Um, you know, put in a little bit of space between myself I'm getting back home. Right, right. Um, and I managed to actually play in the in the vacation cricket team. This was a pickup side because most <laughs> of most of the most of the cricketers would have gone home somewhere. And I had a good time in the in the, in the vacation cricket team. I gave their number one batsman a double duck. <laughs> and that was amazing. <laughs> That was that is that is so marvelous. <laughs> I was bowling crap, <laughs> and uh, which made me very suspicious about cricket. You know, you, you know, cricket is a funny game. You, the worst cricketer on his day, yeah, could be. If the gods of cricket are on his side, yeah, can be. come uh, like could a champion. Yeah. Don't pick him again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can't. Do it. <laughs> he, can't he can't do it. But, but talking about Conrad, though, because one, one, yeah. one of the reasons I bring it up is that there's been a... Right before um, Achebe died, yes. you know Achebe died, there was a, a, a dialogue set up between himself and Carol Phillips. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. About the racism of Conrad. And that was a big, big deal. Yeah, and, well, and but all, the, all of the writers were racists. Mm. 
you are trapped in this thing. You see, you know, you you are trapped in your society, in your history, in your education, in what produces you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Conrad was as trapped as anybody else. Right. The difference between Conrad and most of the others is a that he had seen the world. He had gone around. He had seen all kinds of people. He had been in the Malay archipelago. He had written novels about that. Um, and you began to see what we are now calling a post-colonial post -colonial situation or a neo-colonial situation. Um, he, and those societies that he wrote about there were multi-ethnic. Right. You had the Arabs, yeah. you had uh, the, the, I think you had Chinese, you had uh, English people, interlopers, adventurers, <laughs> getting into trade, and then you had uh, a native Malay character who wanted all of these people out of the place. You had the Dutch, and Conrad is trying to write a novel in which he's dealing with all of these mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and they have different roles. And the Europeans have no idea whatsoever of the people that <laughs> they are trying to rule and dominate, either in trade or in actually ruling the place politically. So in some ways he, he represents or he presents us with a lens through which we could start to look at, at our own situation in the Yeah, that's right. That's that's why I found. I didn't I didn't go to England knowing that. Mm -hmm. But I discovered that very rapidly. Mm -hmm. I mean and so to simply say that Imam is a racist. <laughs> well I mean I, I kinda simply No 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 I, I know I know that um, JBS was position. Yes. The African writers resented Heart of Darkness, yes. resented how Africans were presented in Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. The whole business, uh, the cannibals for example, mm -hmm. they resented it and I can see why they resented it. Um, there was another guy named Echerio mm -hmm. who wrote a very good appraisal of Conrad's Negro of the Narcissus. And he also resented how the, 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 the Afro-Caribbean person, because the nigger was a, a St. Kitts. Kitts. Uh, yeah, who, James Wheat, mm -hmm. who, who joined this ship and looks big and strong, but they find that he's a malingerer. <laughs> he, he, he just ain't doing no work. <laughs> but then they discover that the fellow is actually sick. Right. He, had, he had TB. And uh, he is withering away in front of their eyes. And they're very suspicious about him. <laughs> he's, you know, he had TB or a kind of cancer. Mm. And he's growing thinner and thinner. And they all want him to die because he becomes the Jonah on the ship. Right. And the ship is going through all kinds of problems all kinds of storms, all kinds of things, while he's alive. And finally, he, finally he dies, and they throw him overboard, wrap him in canvas and so on, so on. And, um, and after that, the ship sails. Um, a fascinating but story. That's another thing, though, because Conrad, was, Conrad himself was a seaman. And so there's, a, there's this sense of adventure, this sense of, of um, being a seaworthy um, adventurer. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, again, I don't know if one should focus on the racism in, in mm -hmm. the book. Um, one, one, one would. It would make better sense to, to focus on the superstitious nature that is of this racism 
mm. uh, you know, among the crew. Right. Who, and, and James Waite actually recognizes, hey, these people are scared of me. Mm. And he begins to exploit their, their fears to get extra food, to get some whatever. He begins to exploit their fears. Um, so you get a trickster figure coming in. Mm. And, and I thought that that is... The trickster from St. Kitts. Eh? <laughs> trickster from St. Kitts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, so that, yes, there is racism. And, and I know I'm supposed to feel <laughs> this <is> resentment. <laughs> I remember meeting a, a Pole, mm. um, and a fella had a fella named Naida, N A J D R. Naida had launched a book on Conrad's. I don't think it's Conrad's Polish background, but it's, it's dealing with that. And Naida, and, I, and I, he was launching this thing and. In Birmingham or in London, but I went to the lunch and I'm quite amazed to see me there mm. or somebody looking like the nigger of the narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> James <laughs> Wayne up there. James Wayne, you know. But one fella said, but, but Conrad, he said Conrad was the biggest racist of all and he was a, he, he was a pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I told him, well, yes, but all of you guys <laughs> who are racist. Yeah. So, <laughs> why sing Lord Conrad? Why sing Lord Conrad, <laughs> who was at least more interesting and had a more complicated yeah. vision yeah. Yeah. of racial interaction. I mean, you know, he, he, some of the earlier novels, an outcast of the islands. Mm -hmm. Is this fella, this an English fella, but he has broken caste. Uh, broken, breaking, broken caste. He goes and uh, marries a Malay woman. Mm -hmm. Now the Malay woman is described in magnificent terms. And, me, and I would have married her myself. <laughs> 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 but she is presented as uh, somebody who is the essence of the landscape, the forest, and the swamp. Mm -hmm. So that in marrying her, he is actually marrying the swamp. Right. right. Uh, you know, so there's a, a kind of loathing in there a kind of loathing, and he disintegrates. He, he goes kind of mad, or he talks as if he's mad. He drinks, he gets, and he becomes, you know, he, he, he lets down the side. <laughs> he lets down the side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> you, so, what I'm saying is that Conrad is exploring the racism that he saw around him in, is, within a colonial yeah. within colonial settings. Yeah. The thing is that, I mean, there's, there's so many there's so many topics I'd like to touch on with you. Um, I, I want to go to the 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 the, the uh, uh, question that is uppermost in my mind. It has to do with independence. Mm -hmm. It has to do with independence of the islands. And it has to do with the nature of the popular culture, which fundamentally, up until from from slavery days, emancipation, right up to independence, is mainly a kind of a protest culture. Mm -hmm. And the task of moving from that to what we call a national culture, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to as opposed to protest, as opposed to pushing back to authority, moving into a national independent situation where the authority is now. Uh, we are the authority. The authority is now black, mm. and how how could that be dealt with? Because it seemed to me that if, if you look at Calypso and Trinidad, it seemed to me there's a possibility that there were some problems between the authorities and the protest nature of something like the Calypso. Yeah, um, it's a huge question. 
<laughs> it's huge because we are trying to focus on and to give meaning to that very problematic word, national. How can you have something that is national without first having a nation? Right. And if you're having a nation, what is the nature of this nation that you say that you have or uh, that you're trying to construct, to build, you know, to make evolve? And if it is to evolve, what is it evolving from? Right. So we are moving from essentially segregated, apartheid-ridden communities. Trinidad is a series of islands within the large island. Fragments here, there, and everywhere with invisible boundaries, but don't find yourself there after a certain hour, <laughs> <laughs> <No. laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, we have worked out ways of living with and sometimes against each other. We know instinctively where the boundaries are. And I think that the basic Trinidadian is somebody who lives and lets live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He ain't worried with you once you ain't worried with him. And um, are you live together. And you joke together and play together at a certain point. You become private and you retreat into your little mm -hmm. dens or cells. Now the question <laughs> becomes very cute when you begin to bring intellectual definition mm -hmm. to this thing called nation. Right. And you want to now clarify the boundaries. And uh, not only clarify the boundaries, because these boundaries that you're talking about are boundaries that exist in terms of the landscape. Right. So that there are also political boundaries. Mm -hmm. And they affect voting patterns. So the notion of who has been living in this area is a notion of hmm, how many votes we, we, we can get in Glenside Gardens. And if the population of Glenside Gardens begins to change, then the answer to that question also begins to change. Now, imagine it's the year, what, 1956. Mm -hmm. Eric Williams is, has broken from the Caribbean Commission. He's giving massive lectures about his relationship. He's talking about racism, and he's talking about a, a kind of manipulation taking place in that commission that the average Trinidadian would, know, would have known nothing about. But that Car Caribbean Commission had brought together the French, the Dutch, the British, and the Americans. I don't think there were any Hispanics in it. And they were plotting the course and when I say plotting, I mean plotting. <laughs> the course of the Caribbean for the next 50 years, up to the end of the 20th century. They were talking about the economics, they were talking about health, they were talking about just about everything. And they had these people doing research, and Eric Williams was, was, was part of that. Was part of that. Mm -hmm. Norman Manley was part of that for a time, too. Mm -hmm. um, what Williams discovered was that they would put you to research something that 
was not your specialty. Mm. And they knew that you might have been interested in something else. That, and that this research that you were doing was not meant to be research that would aid in the eventual freedom or independence mm. of the colony or the colonies. In fact, <laughs> they wanted to impede that right. movement um, as much as they could. So what, they set you up to earn a distraction? Well, no, Eric Bell was, a, well, was a, a rebel from Oxford days and from his um, days in the US. And uh, he simply began to research what he wanted to research right. and produced the Negro in the Caribbean, which deals with a lot of the statistics of how people are living, education, how many primary schools, health, how many were dying from, like me, typhoid. <laughs> You're joking, malaria, these were serious things. Yes. Dysentery, <laughs> this, this kind of thing. I mean, you know, what was happening in the rice fields in Guyana, what was happening in Jamaica. And he, he, he saw this as, you're talking about racism. The, this is what is happening to the black man in the Caribbean. And by black, I think he meant not white, actually. But, mm. uh, but, but he also more specifically meant Negro in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, they were really very annoyed that he should do this. And he self-published it, and it, it had the kind of data that the Moyne Commission right. um, would compile a little later, I think. And even when the Moyne Commission compiled this data, the Moyne Commission withheld it until the end of the war because Hitler was looking for propaganda. Right, right. Uh, he was trying to say that the British don't deserve to, hold, to have colonies. This is how they've been treating their colonials. And uh, there was a lot of hiding of, of data. The research became a very <laughs> explosive right. kind of thing to be doing. Yeah. And Williams found himself doing it and found himself getting flack for suggesting that research should not only be done, but should be done into particular areas of relevance, mm -hmm. and that it should be, be spread among the people so they could know what their situation is, and so that they could plot a course for independence yeah, yeah. with knowledge of their true situation. Right now, I mean, we have all these economists and so on who could shred a budget or who could write a budget and I mean, and use all kind of language that I, I can't understand myself, you know. We didn't have that. Right. We didn't have that. When Jagan got into power in 1953, he had to get economists, um, you know, I think there was a guy named Hog Ben. He should have been very scared of a guy with that name. <laughs> but he, 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 you know, but, but he, he, Jack Kelshaw was over yeah. here from Trinidad. Yeah. Uh, Kelshaw would be put in jail mm -hmm. in, uh, after 1970, you know, as one of the, the rebels, the communists that, yeah. that, that, that Williams was afraid of. Right, right. Um, so that, um, you know, the Caribbean Commission was a very important body and it had 
taken on somebody whose notions of what such a, a research commission should be doing were diametrically opposed to what the commission was set up to do, right. and that is to, to present a platform for imperialism. Right. And for not only just imperialism, but for, you may say, the, the multinational imperialist so that, so controlling that, right, state. Right. So that, but Willi then Williams himself then finds himself following this, this, this sense of protest in that situation, and that is the basis for what is going to be a new nationalism. But later on, later on he is, he is in conflict with the Calypso. Present. He's in conflict, and it, that leads right up to 1970, which is which, which, which trajectory I find I find fascinating, and to me is the problem of what does this on independence mean, and how is it articulated? Yeah, because we had not been independent before. Right. That's the first thing. <laughs> the second thing is, and it's all well and good, when like Williams or CLR or Lloyd Best or Walter Rodney, any of us, stay from outside of a situation of r actually running a country, governing a country, particularly a country as volatile as this one, you know, and you say, well, this is what we should do. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a set of people saying we should diversify. Well, how are we going to diversify? What are we going to make that 200 other nations or <laughs> business concerns are not making better than we can ever make it? And to whom are we going to market it? Dominica? St. Lucia? I mean, Kamala told St. Lucia and the others that we are no ATM, and if we're going to, if we're going to give you help, Two pieces of galvanized and thing, you, you, you are going to have to buy our goods. In other words, we will dump our unsellable <laughs> products mm -hmm. on you mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, you know, in reply for whatever aid we give you, which is behaving exactly like how America behaves. Mm -hmm. Or Britain, Britain but, that, but, that, but that's a trap, isn't it? The, the, the situation where the, the, the geopolitics is such that once, whether, whether somebody's in charge of you or you're in charge, you still mm. face, you face with the same... You face with those strictures. And yeah. the question is, what do you do? And uh, Williams... <laughs> but what, did, what did he do? He appointed the Umanefo Commission of Inquiry into subversion. Yes, when he saw a growing kind of Marxism that he attributed to the figure of C.R.R. James. Um, and this, this commission had to look into communism and subversion. Um, they looked and they produced their document and nothing much came out of it except the, the ban on, on James and later on the, the focus on a younger generation now mm -hmm. like who, Stokely, Stokely, come on. Yes, who are all lumped together as people who are following in the footsteps of James. Right. You know, you had a new beginning movement yeah. that was actually doing this with Inslee Mark, Boccarini, and so on. So at one point, we had <laughs> about 20 something Marxist cells in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. 